Chapter 20 Plotter Nabbed When Mr. Drew drove up to the Dite home, it was in darkness. Nevertheless, he pounded on the front door. Finally, Mr. Dite came to let them in. What's the meaning of this call in the middle of the night? He demanded angrily. The lawyer did not waste words. He stated that he wanted to prefer charges against Riggin Trot and demanded the man's address. I don't even know the fellow, Lawrence Dyke blustered. What do you mean by coming here and waking me up with such a stupid question? Maybe you know him as Bushy Trot, Mr. Drew suggested. We have proof that he stole a silk-making process from his former employer, Mr. Booker. You're using the same formula in your own plant. Nonsense! There is no denying it, Mr. Drew declared. My daughter obtained samples of fluid from two different vats in your laboratory. Tests prove them to be the same content as the Booker mixtures. Nancy spoke up. Your employee Trot tonight tried to kill me by tying me up and leaving a black widow spider loose to poison me. The information seemed to stun Mr. Dite. I knew nothing of that, he insisted in a frightened voice. We have poisonous spiders at our plant, but there are also other charges against Bushy Trot. Will you give me his address? Mr. Dite was shaking. Yes, I will. I assure you, I didn't knowingly use the Booker silk-making process, nor did I suspect that Trot was trying to make trouble for your daughter. I'm glad nothing happened to her. Lawrence Dite went quickly to a desk and wrote down Trot's home address. To tell you the truth, I thought for a time Nancy Drew was trying to steal our plant formula, he told the callers. We purchased the new silk-making process from Trot recently at a high price. Mr. Dite sighed and did not speak for several seconds. Finally, he went on. I've kept the silk-making process at the factory a secret, because I was afraid all the workmen in the place might leave if they knew there were poisonous spiders around. The secret you guard so carefully already belongs to my client, Mr. Booker, replied Carson Drew. The only difference is that your man uses poisonous spiders. From what happened tonight, I judge he has a mania for the deadly things. Mr. Dite looked incredulous. You mean to say Bushy Trot sold me a process which he neither owned nor controlled? Exactly. Then I've been tricked, shouted the factory owner. I'll telephone the police immediately and have that man arrested. Within ten minutes, a patrol car was speeding to the Trot home. Mr. Drew, Nancy, and Ned followed in the lawyer's automobile. They arrived in time to see Trot being led from the house by two policemen. He turned deathly white when he saw Nancy. You! he cried unbelievingly. How? Where did you come from? Is this the man? one of the officers asked her, seeking a positive identification. Yes, she replied. I believe his right name is Riggin Trot. The following day, Nancy and her father asked the police if they might speak to the prisoner. Police supplied the information that Trot was an ex-convict. Though he was a clever chemist, after prison he had worked as a chauffeur for Horace Dite, the cousin of Diane's father. Well, that explains a number of things, cried Nancy. Trot talked willingly. Nancy asked, You sold Philip March's music manuscripts to Horace Dite, didn't you? Trot nodded. He said that Dite, always struggling to compose a song which would sell, was hard-pressed financially. 
One day, Trot had slyly suggested to his employer that he knew where saleable songs might be obtained. I didn't tell him where, though. As it developed, Trot had known Fitmarch in the army and made it a point to win his confidence, planning to rob the March mansion eventually. But he didn't tell me exactly where he had hidden the music. The prisoner went on. After Trot got out of the service, he soon landed in jail. By the time he reached the March mansion a few years later, the place seemed hardly worth looting. When he took employment with Horace Dight, Trot remembered that Fip had often played his numerous unpublished compositions. The thief was determined to search for them. One day, when the family was out of town, Trot had explored the main attic. He had discovered the crude door covered by the heavy wardrobe and had investigated the second room. He had found a song which Fip had left on the piano desk. He had sold it to Horace Dite, who had asked for more immediately. Next, I looked for a stairway from the second attic, Trot said. Fip had talked a lot about his childhood in the old house. Once when he was playing in the servant section, he discovered a door which didn't look like a door. It opened onto a narrow stairway leading up toward the section of attic above the servants' quarters. I found the hole in the floor and went down. Later, I put the piano desk over it. Trot said that after his discovery, he had secretly entered the March house by this means. He had terrified Effie, and his footsteps had echoed weirdly through the old mansion. In vain, the man had searched for the missing music. To his surprise, the drawer below the piano keys had opened, revealing two songs. It was then that Trot had dropped the telltale note that Nancy had found. He turned the musical compositions over to Horace Dight, who had them published under the names of Ben Banks and Harry Hall. The songs quickly became popular. Bushy Trot determined to find all of Phipp's creations. Trot was convinced that the music must be hidden somewhere in the piano desk. As he continued to search, he became alarmed, thinking that he might be caught because Nancy and her friends came with increasing frequency to the attic. Cunningly, Trot decided to frighten everyone away. He bored a hole through the secret door back of the wardrobe and also through the wardrobe itself. Then he released a deadly black widow spider from its bottle. It had later crawled through the tiny opening and bitten Effie. I was desperate, Trot said. Nancy asked, what about Horace Dight? Nancy learned that he was so pleased by the success of the stolen songs that he urged Trot to find other compositions for him. The publisher had never suspected anything illegal and first found out that his client was not the composer when he talked with Nancy at the March mansion. The men had words, Trot revealed, and there were threats on both sides. But finally, Mr. Jenner agreed to keep the matter a secret, since he was making money on the musical hits. Horace Dight, now in Trot's clutches, aided the man in various other crimes. He sent him to his gullible cousin, Lawrence Dight, and planned to profit handsomely from the sale of the stolen silk-making process. Due to the astuteness of Nancy and her father, both Horace Dight and Riggin Trot would now be out of circulation for some time. Diane's father, who knew nothing of his cousin's criminal activities, had agreed to pay royalties to Mr. Booker for the use of his formula. The two men were also considering a company merger which would be equitable to both. One day, as Nancy was discussing the forthcoming dance at Emerson College with Bess and George, a parcel arrived for her from the Booker factory. 
Would you like to see what I'm going to wear to the Emerson dance? She asked Bess and George, her eyes sparkling. Come up to my room and we'll open this. The three girls went upstairs. From the box, Nancy brought out a pale yellow evening dress, soft and beautiful in texture. Oh, Bess cried. I never saw anything lovelier. Where did you get it? Mr. Booker sent it to me. He's a client of Dad's. Nancy wished she might tell her friends more, but she had promised the manufacturer she would not divulge his secret. I'll bet you helped your dad on a case, George said wisely, and this is your reward. You're right, Nancy admitted. Bess chuckled. Ask your father if he has a mystery for me to solve with the same reward. The girls laughed, then Nancy said, Anyway, the next mystery I have, I'll share with you. True to her word, Bess and George were invited to join Nancy in solving another perplexing case, the clue in the crumbling wall. A couple of days later, Mr. Drew said to his daughter, You've made two firm friends. I just stopped in to call on Mr. March and Susan. Mr. Jenner has agreed to compensate them for Phipps' stolen songs, and my friend Hank Hawkins is going to publish all the other compositions. The Marches are delighted, and you should hear all the wonderful things they had to say about you. I'm glad to have helped them. Nancy smiled modestly, and it was exciting to hunt for clues in the spooky old attic. Nevertheless, it took courage. Her father replied, If you hadn't had it, you never would have discovered the attic's secrets. The End <laughs>